Good afternoon, family. Good to be here. Let's just um, come to God in quiet and stillness. Our gracious, loving God, have, have your way in us. Have your way on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we'll go through the uh, second chapter of Ruth. We heard um, part of the ending of, of the second chapter of Ruth that Gian just read. Last week, Pastor Mike covered chapter one um, and just gave a really great introduction to, to the book of Ruth. So this is a story of family love and loyalty. Family love and loyalty between two widows. And this story, this true story shines brightly in an otherwise very dark period of Israel's history. Um, it takes place during the time of the judges uh, when murder, immorality, um, and general anarchy uh, was just normal. It prevailed in almost every family. So this story, this gem of a story of light and love and loyalty attests to the fact that with God, there is always hope for a brighter future. There is always hope for a brighter future with God in the picture. So at this point in the story, at the end of chapter one, hope, hope for a brighter future, this was the furthest thing from Naomi's mind. Furthest thing from her mind. So to recap, Naomi is in despair after losing nearly everything she held dear. Uh, she's been living in a foreign land, uh, Moab, which is just uh, southeast of the Dead Sea. She's been living there much longer than she anticipated, 10 years, and she now found herself at rock bottom. Rock bottom. Her beloved husband, Elimelech, and her two dear sons are dead. They're dead. And Naomi is now left not just without her husband and her two sons, but without a means to support herself. So she's now in poverty and without hope for the future. So understandably, as, as we heard last week, uh, at the end of chapter one, we see Naomi wallowing in her bitterness she, to the point where she, even, she doesn't even want to be called by her original name, which means, I can't remember what Naomi means, <laughs> but the opposite of bitter is like happiness, happy, I'm sorry? Pleasant. pleasant, yes. Naomi means pleasant, but she, she identifies so much with her bitterness and her loss that she says, call me Mara, which means bitter. And so she's wallowing in her bitterness and self-pity. She feels very empty, empty. And that's, a, there's a, that's a, an important theme, one of the important themes in, in Ruth. So she feels very empty, even though she has, who does she have in her life? Ruth, but she's like, no, I lost everything. <laughs> like, Ruth is saying, like, no, don't you have, you have me, right? Yeah, I got nothing, no, no. <laughs> so even though she has her faithful non-Israelite daughter-in-law, Ruth, who, her, Ruth, who had chosen to accept her mother-in-law's God, the one true God, the God of Israel as her God, just, She's turning her back on the gods of her mother and her father, the gods of her land, and she's choosing to trust in Israel's God, to stay with her mother-in-law, even unto death. Um, let me, let's just read really quickly through Ruth chapter 1, 20 to 22. Uh, Ruth chapter 1, 20 to 22. Don't call me Naomi, she told them, call me Mara, because the Almighty, El Shaddai, has made my life very bitter. I went away full. She went to Moab full with her husband and two kids. And, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She, the Lord has brought her back to her hometown, uh, Bethlehem, empty. Why call me Naomi? Why call me pleasant? The Lord has afflicted me. El Shaddai has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So the author stresses that Ruth was a, a Moabite, 
Um, and this would have greatly impressed the original readers of Ruth, since Moab and Israel were bitter uh, ethnic enemies, they, so, so much so that the nations worship different gods. So Ruth actually took a great risk. It was very, very risky for Ruth to emigrate to a land that would treat her as an enemy. Not just a foreigner, but an enemy, a despised ethnic enemy. But she goes with her anyway. So Naomi and Ruth and arrive in Bethlehem. She's feeling empty. Have we felt empty before? So Ruth, remember, she's in the darkest place of her life. She feels empty. She feels like she's at rock bottom. And yet she comes back to her homeland, Bethlehem, just as the renewed fullness of the land is just as the barley harvest, just as the land itself is, is beginning to show its fruit so they can, and they can eat. They're going there because they need the food. So this is an early hint that Naomi will be full again. Their stomachs are empty. Her heart is empty. Even her womb is empty because she's old. She can't have children anymore. But so this just sets the scene that God will make her full again so much more than she, she realizes. So let's start with chapter two. Ruth meets Boaz in the grain field. So chapter two, uh, verse one of Ruth. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So in chapter two, there are five important conversations that make up the chapter. There are five conversations. And here we see conversation one. Conversation one is between Ruth and Naomi. Verse two, Ruth the Moabite says to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Now remember, they are in poverty, they're hungry, they need food. So here's a picture of a barley field, just so you get, um, if you've never seen a barley field before, this is um, what a barley field looks like. So Naomi said to her, um, go ahead, my daughter. Nothing else is recorded, just go, go ahead. <laughs> I don't want to talk. So, so Ruth went out, entered a, a field, just a field. I don't know how she picked the field, but somehow God led her to this field and she, be, she began to glean or harvest the barley behind the harvesters that are working in this field. Now in the interna New International Version, it says, as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz. As it turned out, was this coincidence? No, this was not coincidence. So we will see that this is not a coincidence that is actually divine providence at work. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to this very Boaz that was mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, who was from the clan of Elimelech, her dead, her late father-in-law. So in the Old Testament, um, God used several wel welfare programs to help poor people. So we see here uh, God's uh, instruction to care for poor people actually happening. So one of them reflected in this passage. There was a, a command uh, to leave some of the harvest in your field uh, for the poor or the needy to gather. And we see this in Le uh, partly in Leviticus 19. So we can go to Levi Leviticus 19 verses 9 to 10. Leviticus 19, 9 to 10. Uh, and here God gives the instruction when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over a vineyard a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Leave them, leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am Yahweh, your God. So we see God's law was persistently concerned with the welfare of the poor. So much so that even everyday farming was to be done in such a way that the poor or the foreigner could fend for themselves. And God's laws built a concern for the poor into the Israelites' daily routine. Uh, the reasons for such care are given in Leviticus 19 verse 2, which says that we are to imitate the holy character of God. 
be holy because I am holy. And one of the ways that we show, express God's holiness is care for, for the needy, for those who are marginalized, for those who are poor. As well as in Leviticus 19 verse 18, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, a similar instructions were given by God in Deuteronomy 24, where he says to leave the remainder of your harvest for the foreigner, for the fatherless, and the widow. The foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. And Ruth fit each of these categories. Um, it's also important to note that gleaning, especially as a poor, an impoverished person, this was humiliating. It was just showing to the public that you are in poverty. It was humiliating and sometimes even dangerous work, especially in the time of judges, where women were very, very mistreated. So Ruth, being a single woman and a foreigner, she showed a lot of courage. She showed so much courage, choosing to fend for herself and her, her mother-in-law. And her diligence soon attracted the, the foreman's attention. And we see this in conversation two between Boaz and his workers. So let's continue um, to verse four of Ruth chapter two. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. Yahweh be with you. Yahweh bless you, they, asked, they answered. So here we, we see Boaz's character already. Um, Boaz and his farm uh, workers, they acknowledge their dependence on Yahweh for a good harvest, they, the, de the dependence on God to provide for them from the land. And it shows that in the time of the judges when, when men, there was just a lot of immorality, men took advantage of so many people and, and women. Boaz, we see him as, as kind-hearted, a godly man, a rare godly man in this dark time. And the fact that Ruth was even able to glean on, from Boaz's field at all meant that Boaz followed God's instructions from the Torah. From The Torah is a, the, also called teaching, the first five books of the Bible. Um, so he, he followed God's instructions to care for the needy. Um, so again, it shows Boaz's character. A uh, kind-hearted, godly man. So verse 5, uh, Ruth 2, two, verse 5, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is a Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So we see the foreman giving Boaz, his, his boss, the landlord, he gives him a good testimonial about Ruth. And he even gave uh, three recommendations that won her respect uh, by Boaz. She had come courageously as a foreigner with the Isra uh, Israelite Naomi. She asked permission. She didn't just go in the field and start picking food. She asked permission from uh, the foreman to pick up what the reapers left. And not only that, but she had worked steadily. She's worked steadily on uh, gleaning, even though it was discouragingly unrewarding work. So that was conversation two. Conversation three is in the next verses between Boaz and Ruth. And here we start to see more of Boaz's godly character and unexpected kindness that was, that's given to Ruth. So verse eight, conversation three. Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Do not go and glean in another field. Stay here, don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to touch you, not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she, at this unexpected kindness, 
she bowed down with her face to the ground. And Ruth asked Boaz, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me? You notice me, a foreigner. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May Yahweh repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. We can take refuge under the wings of our God. God's people love to compare God's protecting care to a bird spreading her wings over, over her chicks. And Jesus, we see Jesus himself in the New Testament uses this same metaphor for himself. And, and we'll see um, towards the end of Ruth, as well as in the biblical story, how this prayer, that this blessing that Boaz gives Ruth, that may you be richly rewarded by Yahweh, this prayer is amazingly answered. The Lord never gives up on us. Let's continue to verse 13. And here Ruth says, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord? She said, you have put me at ease. You, you've eased my anxiety uh, by speaking kindly to me, to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. So she continues working. And then at mealtime, verse 14, Boaz says to her, come over here, come here, come here with us, with the workers, you know, have some bread, dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, Boaz offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and even had some left over. She even had some left over. She was full. When we choose to depend on God, he gives us, he fills us up. He fills our tummies. He fills our, our hearts. He fills our lives with good things, as we've already heard today so much more than we ask or imagine. So the next verses are, is the conversation four, again, between Boaz and his, his workers. But Boaz gives instructions to his workers. Verse 15, as Ruth got up to glean again after, I guess it was a lunch break, uh, Boaz gives orders directly to his men. And we see him going beyond what the Torah instructs. Boaz gives order to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So it was customary for the men to cut the grain or, or reap the grain as they're, as they're going through the field and then the servant girls behind that will go behind them to bind the grain I guess with some kind of rope into sheaves. Then Ruth could glean what they had left behind. Um, but he's telling them to even, even the sheaves, uh, let's take a uh, show the picture of the barley sheep just so you know what a sheaf looks like. Um, so he's telling them, don't just um, leave, leave even more for her to pick up. Take some of the, uh, the stalks from the sheaves that have already been bundled together take them and then leave even more for her to pick up. So she has even more to glean than what are, what's already been left. So he goes beyond. <laughs> and, and in him, in, in the character of Boaz, we get a glimpse of the character of our savior, of our God who goes beyond, infinity and beyond, to be with us, to, to love us, to save us, to bring us back under, under his, his care and his wings and his, his provision and his joy. So the result was that Ruth finished the day with so much more um, of, for her work than she ever dared to hope to glean just that day. Verse 17, Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, until nighttime. 
Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah or ephah. I'm not sure exactly. But so this was what the point here is that this was an unusually large amount. This was an abundance just for, for one day's gleaning. This was one day, this was approximately equivalent to at least half a month's wages. Half a month's wages. Again, they have nothing. They're grieving. They're at the bottom. They're impoverished. impoverished. They're em their stomachs were empty. And here, in this foreign land, we see the one true God, the God of Israel, the, our God providing for what she probably feels like the least likely person to receive this, this generosity and care and love. So that was conversation four, and, and now we'll see the last conversation five at the end of the day uh, between Naomi and Ruth. So Ruth has, does she have good news? Yes, she has very good news, and she has good food to share as well. So Naomi is in for quite a surprise. Um, let's go to verse 18. So Ruth carries her abundance of food back to town, and which I, it's just amazing the strength. I don't know how, I mean, she would have been sweating the whole day. What it, how heavy it would have been just to, to thresh all that and carry it on her back and carry it back to town, but wow, just her diligence. So, um, her, and her mother-in-law, would we'll see how much she had gathered. Uh, Ruth also brought out and gave her, Naomi, what she had left over after she, after she had eaten enough. So Naomi asked her, verse 19, she's probably like, oh my goodness, wow, so much food. Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Oh, wow, like, praise y'all, hallelujah, hallelujah, wow. Ruth, and then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the, the one place that, that, that she had been working that day. The name of the man I worked with today is, is Boaz, Boaz. Oh, Yahweh, bless him, bless him. So she's just so surprised at that, wow, she was not expecting this. She was probably completely depressed the whole day up until that evening where her faithful daughter-in-law brings the evidence of God's unfailing love and, and provision for this small family. Yahweh bless him. And he, and she's, he, he has not showing, stopped showing his kindness. And she's, she means God. She means the Lord. The Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. The Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. In evidence of this abundant generosity, Naomi remembers the Lord's providence. Like, this was not an accident. Like, God, your, your fingerprints are all, over, are all over this. Thank you. This is God's, the Lord's evidence of his covenant love. His, uh, in Hebrew, it's called chesed. God's chesed, his covenant love and his loyalty to, to this family, to just these people, and her dead husband and her sons. In spite of having felt that Yahweh had deserted her, Naomi recognizes that that was false. In reality, Yahweh had not stopped caring for her and her family. Yahweh's kindness to Naomi and Ruth was shown through the kindness of Boaz, as well as through Ruth's kindness to Naomi. We see this chesed in this story through deep personal care. Chesed is deep personal care through faithful love, self-giving, and enduring commitment. Let's continue. Naomi added, that man, Boaz, is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. Not only have he received this, this, this abundance, but 
the man, the very man that of that this field belongs to. Wow, he's one of our kinsmen or guardian redeemers. And so redemption, as we'll also see more next week, redemption is a key concept in Ruth as well as in the biblical story. The guardian redeemer was responsible for protecting the interests of needy members of the extended family. Um, translations of the, of the same Hebrew word, kinsman, redeemer, and avenger. Avenger, not Marvel Avengers, but av the word avenger and kinsman, redeemer was actually used in the same Hebrew word. So Naomi is encouraged when she hears that the Lord has led Ruth to the fields of a relative who might serve as her avenger, her guardian redeemer. And this moment is a critical turning point in the story where Naomi, who's at rock bottom, hopeless, has nothing. She feels that she has nothing. Her hope is awakened. Her hope is awakened. She experiences unexpect, unexpected hope. And so let's just finish the story of Ruth chapter 2, uh, verse 21. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He, even Boaz, even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. So she'll be able to, to keep getting food until the end of the harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, and now it's showing the, the connection of the deep connection between daughter and mother. It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished. And she lived, she stayed with her mother-in-law. She stuck with her. So we see Ruth's faithfulness. Ruth shows the faithfulness of God, showing his blessing through the kindness of people. We experience God through the kindness of the people around us. In spite of Naomi's experience of disaster and tragedy, God is still with his people. God is still present with this little family, showing kindness, showing covenant love, his hesed, acting as their covenant God. And so we see in the New Testament, in Jesus, God's covenant love. In Jesus, we see God's chesed revealed to us and the world. So even in the darkest and the lowest times, are we living in dark times? <laughs> even in the darkest and lowest times, God is still moving. God is still working. God is still speaking through the kindness of his people. When we find ourselves empty with no hope for the future, God is still present and he is ready to fill us to overflowing. So next week, we'll hear from Pastor Burmy covering uh, chapter three of Ruth. God bless you, church, as you live out your awakened hope in Jesus, our amazing covenant God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.